Okay, uh, hello. Um, uh, today we'll talk about two architects, both connected uh, with uh, with the, this day of March. Uh, we'll start with uh, Donato Bramante, uh, and um, uh, let's. Uh, I I I I learned that he was born on uh, on uh, uh, on this day, but I see here that the, the actual uh, day of his birth is unknown. Anyway, we'll talk about Donato Bramante born in 1444 and died um, the 11th of April, 1514. Uh, also known as Bramante Lazzari, was an Italian architect and painter. He introduced Renaissance architecture to Milan and the high Renaissance style to Rome, where his plan for St. Peter's Basilica formed the basis of design executed by Michelangelo. His San Pietro, San Pietro in Montorio, marked the beginning of the High Renaissance in Rome. It was built in 1502 when Pope Julius II appointed him to build a sanctuary over the spot where Peter was martyred. And we are going to see Il San Pietro, of course. Now, this is an engraving of, we don't know for sure if that's how he looked like. Uh, I found another portrait of his um, of him. Um, I don't know. Again, you know, usually these um, engravings uh, were done uh, um, after the death of of the one depicted, and uh, the imagination of the engraver, um, you know, uh, sometimes um, benefited from a lot of uh, so-called poetical license. Anyway. Uh, Donato Bramante, some drawings of this artist architect. Um, I don't think too many drawings because they are fragile, um, you know, resisted the passage of time. But we see a few, a few uh, sketches by him and um, a few paintings. I will show some paintings and then we'll look at his architectural work. It's not going to be a very ample presentation. I have a, a, a little more than 80, 80 images, but it's an introduction to the work of Donato Bramante. Paintings, because he was a painter as well. Christ of the Column, which is actually a, a, a stunning uh, a point, pa painting, if we are to call it so. Um, a very muscular Christ, you know, it's almost, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, so it is called Christ of the Column, but uh, there is almost some, some kind of a modernity here in the way he depicted the body of Christ. I'm almost tempted to double check to make sure that this is indeed by, by Bramante, but I did, I did double check and it seems this is the painting of Donato Bramante. It, in a way, it was kind of easy for the painters and the artists at the time, sculptors, painters, and so on, because they worked within the religious canon. They, they didn't invent themes. They were not free like we are. So, you know, most of them just depicted biblical scenes. And they just tried to, to do a good job. Uh, but uh, we have now total freedom, so we are confused, actually, what to paint. You can paint flowers, you can paint your own, uh, uh, you know, soul, you can paint, uh, I don't know, uh, scenes from Mars, you can do anything. And when you can do anything, nothing truly matters. It is, I mean, I see here Donato Bramante, uh, Cristo e flagellato, but he doesn't look so flagellated. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish I had such a body, you know. If it was flagellated, let it be like this. But anyway, an impressive painting and an impressive uh, frame of the painting. Donato Bramante. Another painting by him. The 
were artists, of course. They didn't have to deal with parking uh, lots and garages and uh, refrigerators and toilets. They were artists. What can we say? A big difference. Now we, we are going to see some of his built work. Santa Maria Preso Santiro in Milan. 1482-1486. I like the architecture of uh, Donato Bramante. It's, um, it's very balanced. It's, um, and it has some, some, I don't know how to call it, a certain gravity. It's not, he's not an excessive, he's not, he's not trembling. He's, he has his certitudes, and he works almost within the classical canon. I mean, look at this facade. It's 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 a Renaissance, but it's it's you know the facade of the church has something of a temple, and it's very well balanced. Real, I mean, aesthetically speaking. Milan, Donato Donato Bramante. The interior is. Uh, itself, uh, you know, uh, well, well constituted and impressive. I couldn't find, I mean, I found pictures, but uh, there are distractions because of all kinds of, uh, I, I would have liked to see more the architecture without too many, you know, uh, other interests, visual interests, but what can you do? You know, it's, they, very rarely at that time they would leave the walls of the of the church bare. So this is the plan. So this is this was built in Mila. Donato Bramante. The interior, although it's much smaller, makes me think a little bit of uh, Sant'Andrea in Mantua by Alberti, which was built later. No, no, he, he, was, a, he was an excellent uh, architect, uh, Bramante, no doubt. No wonder that he was chosen to design the first plans of the new St. Peter Basilica. And we are going to see the evolution of those plans. There was an existing old uh, basilica there, but when they decided to build a new one, he was the first one to, uh, to draw some plans. Uh, and in the end, what he drew was respected by Michelangelo himself as well. Uh, we are still in Milan. Not in, uh, not in Rome, Santa Maria delle Grazie, the cloister and the apse. Also in Milan, Santa Maria delle Grazie, he only built the cloister and the apse. And we are going to see a few images, the end of the 15th century. Again, what we look at here, he didn't actually build. He, he built the cloister and we'll see the the back, so to speak, the, the eastern facade of the of, of the of the church. Uh, here I'm a little bit confused I, because he built another cloister in Rome, and I'm afraid that this picture is actually from that cloister, Santa Maria della Pace, de Pace. We are going to see it. It might be that this picture it belongs to to that. Um, they are very similar these two cloisters, the one in Rome with the one in Milan. This is the apse. So the eastern facade of the, of the church, the entrance being the opposite, uh, on the opposite facade, the, the western one. Always the altar, as you know, is at east 
So you enter the church or the cathedral through the western facade and you move towards the altar, which is, which is supposed to be always at east. And why at east? Because that's where the sun rises. And this is important because, uh, you know, you move towards the rising sun or you move towards Christ. You move towards, in a way, the birth of your faith. Now, the Ten Pietro, San Pietro in Montorio, which is a beautiful, I don't know, it's a little temple, as essentially, uh, built in 1502. I, to my shame, I don't know its function. It's known as the Ten Pietro. That, uh, you know, we are dealing with a, you know, with a Christian which, with a Christian building. So it cannot be a temple. This is the drawing by Palladio of this beautiful masterpiece by Donato Bramante. I love this sketch. This No, sorry, I shouldn't call it sketch. I love this drawing by Andrea Palladio. And once I did myself a, I had an idea for a, you know, a, a sculpture museum I placed the beginning of the world, the sculpture by Brincouche, on a pedestal inside this, uh, this building by uh, Donato Bramante. I actually drew it, inserted into this uh, drawing by Andrea Palladio. Now here it is, Il Tempieto, Donato Bramante, more than 500 years ago. Both the plan and the half section, half elevation are by Palladio. It's very interesting, actually, when you look at it, you know, it's almost like a rotated square, which becomes almost a circle. And, and, and the perception is that it is a circular, but uh, well, you see the plan. I also love these drawings by Andrea Palladio, half section, half elevation. I keep saying, how come that Andrea Palladio didn't use perspectival drawings? Because perspective was already invented with about 150 years before him. I never saw a perspectival drawing by him. He always used Euclidean representations, bi-dimensional, two-dimensional drawings, like this. It was enough. And we are talking, of course, about one of the most important architects, if not the most important. I'm talking about individual individual architects, because um, you know, co collective uh, groups of architects build significantly in, in many cultures. But as an individual architect, uh, Palladio is uh, quintessential. This drawing, I don't like it as a drawing. Somebody did it, but I chose to include it in the presentation because it shows also what happens. You know, uh, uh, usually this is not shown, and Palladio didn't show the the space underneath the the main floor of the of the of Il Tempieto. Of course, the drawing is much less graceful than, than the one we saw by Palladio, but uh, this one shows uh, something that Palladio didn't show. So if you go to Rome, please do not, do not forget to visit it. It's worth it.
il tempietto donato a Bramante. If you don't know it's there, you could very well miss it because you see, you pass by, here is the street, but you don't know that, uh, you know, if you climb these stairs and you go through this uh, the building, you discover this architectural jewel. You have to know it's here, otherwise you, you miss it. It's like a precious thing that is hidden. That's exactly what it is. This precious building is a little bit hidden. Five hundred years old, a little more than five hundred years old, half a millennium, still standing. I wonder how many of our buildings will still be alive in 500 years, five centuries. Apparently this is actually a drawing by him, but I don't know, that's, that's what I read. Now, Santa Maria de la Pace, but not the, not the church, just the cloister, just like in Milan, from 1504. This church has a famous facade, but main, main facade, main elevation, but uh, that, done by Pietro da Cortona, not by Donato Bramante. But he did the, the Again, I, I have to study further to, to differentiate between the cloister in Milan and the cloister in, in, in Rome. This is in Rome. Now you see in the plan. So this main elevation of the building was done by Pietro da Cortona, and it's magnificent. And then the cloister is here, and this was done by uh, Donato Bramante. I don't know who built all the church. I don't think it was uh, Pietro da Cortona. Pietro da Cortona took care just of the front entrance of, into the church. But they, these kind of buildings uh, often employ the services of several architects. Pietro da Cortona probably reinvented the facade because he was a Baroque architect as opposed to the to Donato Bramante who lived and worked earlier. Now, there is here a beautiful, um, I almost said conflict, you know, interplay between con concave, the concave and the convex in the, in the spirit of, of, of the Baroque uh, dialectics. But in the case of uh, Donato Bramante, things are more uh, less dramatic and, and, and closer to the spirit of classicism. Now, I, I found this uh, image on the internet. Uh, I guess now you can speculate graphically about the proportions of the courtyard of the cloister. Uh, if they are correct or not, I don't know. But this happens all the time in the case of, uh, you know, architectures built you know, before Renaissance and only, not only before Renaissance, but this speculative uh, um, analysis that uh, tries to discover the, you know, the, the why the why the harmony the the architectural harmony came into being 
And, you know, some people uh, probably in their analysis uh, think of things that the architect himself might not have thought. It's possible. I don't know. Now we arrive at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. His design from 1503 and the groundbreaking took place in 1506. So St. Peter, the famous building in Rome, began the construction in 1506. So 517 years ago, but the design by Bramante, Donato Bramante was from 1503. This is what he proposed. This was the plan, but that's not how it was executed. But it did have an influence on Michelangelo and the building was built according to Michelangelo and then Maderno came in and, 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 and uh, you know, changed things uh, um, dramatically or significantly. But the beginning of, of Donato Bramante um, is still there through, I mean, via Michelangelo Buonarroti. And here we see the four plans, there were a few others. Old St. Peter from 4th century, that's how it was in the 4th century. Well, we are talking now about the 16th century. Bramante in 1506, but we read before that he did a scheme in 1503. But that's when the new basilica began to be built, 1506. This is the plan Bramante did. This is the plan that Michelangelo did in 1546. So 40 years later, Michelangelo did a scheme for the plan of St. Peter, not very different, different, but not dramatically different from what Bramante did. And then the way the St. Peter looks like today is actually like this. This is the plan of the, the you know the the most important uh, building uh, you know for uh, Western uh, Christianity, if not for Christianity as a whole, is is like this. So Bramante, Michelangelo, Maderno, but Maderno completed. You see, he lengthened the nave as opposed to Michelangelo and Bramante, and created a new facade, and that's how the building looks like today. But you see, from this year when Bramante did the first scheme to this year when Maderno completed the building, more than 100 years passed. And here we see a few others. We see Raphael, the great artist, painter, and architect. He, he had a long nave, just like uh, Maderno. Bramante, we already saw, Peruzzi, Sangallo, and Michelangelo. Michelangelo somehow returned to the first intuitions of Bramante. Bramante, Raffaello, Raphael, Peruzzi, Sangallo, Michelangelo, or Michelangelo. Uh, in this drawing, the scheme by the final one by Maderno is not shown, but the building today is like this. Well, not only today, from 1607, 1612, 1612 onwards. But we see the importance of Donato Bramante. He was the initiator of the series of plans for this important building for Christianity. Cortile del Belvedere in Vatican from 1506. Now here also I'm a little bit confused because there are actually two and I'm not sure if he worked for both or just one. I will show both though. You see them here. One court is here, Cortile. Courtyard and here is another one. And there is a difference in, uh, not just in height, but also in, um, you know, this is sunken. It's at a, at a lower level. So I don't know which one of them was designed by um, 
Donato Bramante. Maybe he worked for both. I, I, I don't know. Strange to see so many cars right there, you know, at the core of the Vatican, inside the Cortile. You see Cortile Superiore and Cortile Inferiore. I don't know on which one Donato Bramante worked. Maybe on both. I should have informed myself, but uh, for the moment, I do not know. You see here in section that, you know, that the terrain is not flat. So here the building has just one floor while, while here it has three floors. Palazzo Caprini, also known as Raphael's house. Uh, it was demolished in the 17th century. So there are just some drawings now. There are not, there aren't photographs because in the 17th century, the photographer didn't yet show up. This was the facade of this Palazzo Caprini, which I guess was to become or became the house where Raphael, the great artist and the architect, lived. Now you will see also a perspectival drawing of this um, uh, palace. I guess the design was done by Donato Bramante. Well, the young Raphael uh, was doing very well for himself because, you know, he died at 37, if I'm not mistaken. So being very young, he was still, I mean, can you imagine at uh, 37 having such a palace? And I understood he was trying to build also something even much bigger in Rome. So I guess great artists were highly, highly appreciated. In addition to building, and this is the last thing I say tonight about Bramante, is that Bramante wrote about architecture and composed 80 sonnets. So in addition to building, Bramante wrote about architecture and composed 80 sonnets. Nice. Okay, and I will go about, uh, I'll talk about a very different architect uh, from the United States. Thomas Hastings, and this architect, uh, um, I postponed uh, making a presentation about him for, for some time, but uh, today I decided to, uh, to change. So, Thomas Hastings, 1860-1929. This was the man, it was very hard to, to find pictures with him, although he was immensely successful and became very rich. And we are going to see his apartment uh, in, 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 in Manhattan, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, almost uh, unacceptably uh, opulent. An interesting man, though, he worked, he had a partner, uh, an, a partner, and we are going to talk about both. So Thomas Hastings, born on March 11th, and that's the reason we talk about him today, born in 1860 and died in 1929 in a hospital, I guess, because of complications in an operation while his partner died in a car accident, much younger. So Thomas Hastings was an American architect, a partner in the firm of Carrer and Hastings, active from 1885 to 1929. Let's notice here in 1885, he was 25 years old when they opened Carrer and Hastings opened their own office. Thomas Hastings' apartment on the roof of 52 Vanderbilt Avenue, entirely planned by himself. 
overlooks New York's picturesque roof line from river to river. That's, that's how I found the text about his apartment. And we, we are going to, to read and to look at pictures from a, from a website that I found about him. Now you tell me how many architects have such a living room today? <laughs> I mean, even the most successful, you know, it's not that they couldn't afford it. It's just that, you know, this Im immersion into history and collecting, you know, it's, it's, it's a different spirit. Although, although, you know, he died one year or two years after Villa Savoie was built after so uh you know i mean he was 20 i think 27 uh, let's see he was born in 1860 and le corbusier was born in 1887 so he was 27 years older than le corbusier meaning born tw uh, 27 years before le corbusier but 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 could you imagine, you know, that in just 27 years, things could change so dramatically in architecture? Although here you, you look at the, op the opulence of the, of the living room and, the, you know, the collecting and the furniture and the fireplace uh, is in contrast, almost contradiction with the, with the roof, because the roof is done in concrete and it's rather, rather raw, R-A-O. This intrigues me, you know, the, the luxury, the opulence, the softness, the, you know, the history of the interior, and then the much more austere uh, ceiling and roof. Very interesting. Hastings, Thomas Hastings. Let's uh, read a little bit about his apartment. Above, meaning the picture we just looked at, is the living room of Mr. Hastings' roof apartment. The walls of this room are plastered in uneven surface in a yellow tone. Much of the woodwork is antique fragments of carved wood. The beams of the hipped roof are concrete cast in rough planks and painted to the tone of the rest of the wood. And now referring to the next picture, the picture below is the library of Mr. Hastings' office. On all four sides, the books go to the ceiling and there are some beautiful bits of old woodwork shown. The furniture as in the rest of the apartment is antique, of course, much of it 17th century Italian, as well as a steward table and 18th century Italian chair and the quaint there is written wrongly, Savonarola chair against the wall. And, and this text referred to this picture. This is just the library of the architect. And this is the Savonarola chair. You know, I don't know from what century, but anyway, a different, a different kind of architect. I mean, an architect obviously seduced by Europe. He studied the, the Bazaar in, in Paris and he brought the fascination with history uh, back to the United States. But this penthouse, because that's what it is, a penthouse was on top of this, you know, very North American building. You know, uh, you wouldn't expect looking at the building from the outside and look at the cars. You wouldn't expect, you know, the luxurious uh, historicist interiors that we looked at, you know, like this one or like this one. New York City. Yes, indeed. But but beyond the appearance of these tall buildings, within, for those who afforded it, a great nostalgia for Europe. A nostalgia Frank Leroy didn't have, 
nor uh, Louis Sullivan, who claimed that he spent many years trying to forget what he learned in school, the very same school where Thomas Hastings studied, meaning uh, Le Col de Beaux-Arts, or the Académie de Beaux-Arts. Le Col de Beaux-Arts was, was uh, you know, the most important architecture school in the world then, but uh, those with the uh, an inclination uh, leaning towards uh, uh, breaking the rules didn't feel comfortable in that high school or not uh, that I call the bazaar. Uh, this is the plan where Thomas Hastings brought his uh, European dreams into an office building, a typical North American office building. from that time. He was doing well, what can we say? Now, we look at the, a few works, they built a lot, but I only show a few works by Carrer and Hastings, and I start with the uh, New York Public Library, a uh, very important building on the map of Manhattan, on the map of New York City, I was many times inside that building and in front of that building. Uh, but before, before we look at that building, let's contemplate uh, first uh, a picture, not with Thomas Hastings, but his partner, uh, Carrer. This, uh, this was Thomas Hastings, Hastings, and this was his partner. Apparently, his partner took care of the admin administrative tasks of the office and, and the artist, so to speak, was, uh, was him, Thomas Hastings, born on March 11th, 1860. So John Mervyn Carrer, born, he was two years older than Thomas Hastings, and he died in 19, 1911, so in a car accident. So he died at 53, and Thomas Hastings died in 1929, were two of the most preeminent architects of America's Gilded Age. Their firm was launched on the national stage when Henri Flagler, standard oil executive and railroad magnate, commissioned the pair, the pair to design two hotels and two churches in St. Augustine, Florida from 1886 to 1890. So in 18, 1886, Thomas Hastings had, was 26 years old very young and uh, but uh, through family connections he got this these commissions uh, and uh, we are going to see but well, this is what thomas hastings wrote to john uh, john carrer we are going to florida we've got a million dollar hotel to build there i mean you can imagine the the excitement of this 25 years old man because in 1885 he was 25 years old you know, getting the, such a commission, a million, you can imagine at that time, one million dollar cost. I mean, one million dollar is one million dollar today as well. Although for some people, it might not uh, appear to be big money, but for me it is, it's huge. But in 1885, my God, my God, I mean, you know, it was almost an infinite amount of money. So this is what they built. Uh, you see, there are carriages on the streets, no cars. But they did a, a good job. And, uh, you know, some years later, they won the competition for the prestigious New York Public Library, which they built, when, which is still standing and is an important building in Manhattan. The grand lobby of the Ponche de Leon Hotel at St. Augustine by Carrer and Hastings, 1887. Look at this. I mean, you know, I, I maybe even Zaha Hadid would have uh, trembled a little bit, you know, uh, at, the, at the opulence of, of the interior from 1885, 1889, 1890, I don't know, 1887. 
I guess it pays to be an oil executive. It paid then, it pays now, and it will forever pay until we run out of oil on this earth. But amazingly, that that magnate, that you know, immensely rich client, had confidence in these young people. You know, 25, 27 years old. He could have hired any architect in the world. He could have hired the Frank Lloyd Wright. He was alive and kicking. And he hired these young people. In a way, very nice. So following their success, um, just a second, because again, I cannot read the whole, I, I, you can read in, in St. Augustine, Carrere was appoint, appointed chief architect of the of the of the 1891 Pan, Amer Pan American ex ex exposition in Buffalo, New York, bringing further recognition to the firm. Their reputation was cemented by winning the competition for the New York Public Library in 1897, beating out their former employers, very famous McKim, Madden, White. While so you can imagine, you know, they won the competition, not their, not their employers. While their careers blossomed, the architects maintained their relationship with the Henri Flagler, the, the, the rich man who commissioned them in, in Florida. In 1902, Flagler engaged Carrere and Hastings to build his home in Palm Beach, Florida, and we are going to see it, named Whitehall, the 75 rooms. 100,000 square foot Bozar mansion was described by the New York Herald uh, newspaper as more wonderful than any palace in Europe, grander and more magnificent than any other private dwelling in the world. Wow. Anyway, they had, uh, you know, 75 rooms. Bill Gates in his home that he shared with his wife I don't know if they are still together. They only had seven, seven bedrooms, although it's a huge complex of buildings, but so seven bedrooms, but 24 bathrooms. Bill Gates, who teaches us about saving water, had and has, maybe he still lives, lives there, 24 bathrooms. My God, my God. Anyway, let's move forward. What is here? This is the New York Public Library that they won the competition and built. Over the course of its history, the firm of Carrere and Hastings produced some of America's finest and most uh, notable um, edifices. Civic buildings, private residences, public plazas and parks, all defined by the Beaux-Arts principles they studied in Paris. One of the firm's major contributions was in the realm of urban design, a result of Carrère's abiding interest in the Beaux-Arts city beautiful movement. An early advocate of city planning, he designed downtown plans for Baltimore, Hartford, Cleveland, and Atlantic City. In addition to Flag Flagler's St. Augustine hotels, Carrere and Hastings most celebrated commissions include Flagler's Whitehall 1902, uh, the New York Public Library 1911, the Henry Clay Freak Residence 1914, and the Manhattan Bridge Approaches and Triumphal Archway 1916. Now I will show a few buildings by them, the New York Public Library. Here it is. It's the Research Library, as it is called, a much smaller branch of the New York Public, Public Library is across the street. My first job in New York City was actually in this building here. I didn't uh, know then uh, how important this building was. And behind the library is the, the Bryan Park. And here on the right is uh, the famous 42nd Street. This is uh, a historic uh, picture, I would say, considering the snow. But I'm wrong because I understood that this year it did snow a lot in, in, in New York City, unlike in Bucharest. A picture may be less impressive because of the absence of the trees. So you see the trees do matter. 
here we don't see too many trees and it looks bare, but also we don't see skyscrapers and so on. We just see the New York Public Library and not too many cars on the, on the streets either. So it was built, this building in 1911, so 113 years, 112 years ago. Here it is, how it is now. It's, it's, a, it's a major building, uh, an important building in, uh, in, uh, in New York City. Apparently the designer in the firm of Carrere Hastings was Thomas Hastings, whose birthday is today. And I will say it's a good building. It's a good building. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, even at the level of details, and we are going to see some details, uh, the reading room, you know, very, very comfortable and, and uh, with, with dignity. An old picture, easily understood as being old, considering the cars, but, you know, the cars are as they are, but their number is showing signs of uh, the car taking over our cities, New York included. Carrera and Hastings. the reading room before the arrival of the monitors, as we see them here. And, and uh, um, here we see, I, I have two pictures from the studio of um, Carrera and Hastings. You know, drafting boards, large, large drafting boards and architects drawing, drawing and drawing again. That's what architects are good at, right? This is the plan of the library as they won the competition with. Another scene from the studio. Not too many people, <laughs> and only men, of course. There were no women architects at that time. Actually, this man here on the left, he seems to might be actually Thomas Hastings. And some uh, so-called details. I mean, look, <laughs> those who oppose ornaments should look again, because I don't think such things, you know, are, um, you know, fatally detrimental. Quite the opposite. I think they add something to the building. You know, a narration, a sense of humor, a sense of, uh, I don't know, mythology, uh, history, uh, even melancholia, why not? And, and, and we have a fresco on top here uh, called, uh, you know, referring to the myth of uh, Prometheus bringing fire to the humans. Uh, we don't think of such matters any longer, but at that time in 1911, 19 whatever, 12, 13, 14, people still valued uh, mythology and symbolism and uh, maybe, maybe, 
we could uh, we could rejuvenate a little bit this uh, art. Here it is. Uh, it was not painted by uh, Thomas uh, Hastings or his uh, partner Carrer, John Carrer, but you know it, it was included symbolically because yes, besides the mythical. Uh, problem with the, with the apple that uh, Eve uh, uh, received and uh, both her and Adam, um, you know, uh, took a bite from the bite of, from, you know, the apple of, of, of knowledge. Uh, fire given to humans by Prometheus had a significant role, very significant. But what is strange, perhaps, or maybe not strange, is I learned rather late that Prometheus had a brother, and has, his name was Epimetheus. And in Greek, Prometheus means the one who first thinks, and then he acts. While Epimetheus means the very opposite, the one who first acts, and then he thinks. Also, an important difference between Prometheus and Epimetheus was that Prometheus loved the humans, but didn't care about the gods, didn't care about the plants, the animals, and the stones, while Epimetheus was the opposite. He, 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 he had reverence for the gods and uh, uh, loved um, not the humans like Prometheus, but he loved plants, animals, and stones. I think Epimetheus must be reconsidered. And in a way, Epimetheus was the first ecologist. Not egologist, but ecologist. Anyway, another view of this, uh, you know, depiction of Prometheus giving fire to the humans. Without fire, without that fire, we wouldn't be where we are today. But on the other hand, Maybe a consequence of that fire is also the fact that the climate is warming and the icebergs are melting and the levels of the seas are rising. The elevation of the New York Public Library designed by uh, Carrer and Hastings, the great public library, which is to stand in Bryan Park, New York City, fronting upon with uh, fronting upon Fifth Avenue between the 40th and 42nd Street, front elevation of the accepted design by Carrer and Hastings. And this is, uh, I don't know, a funny drawing. I don't know when, when it was done. Uh, anyway. The New York Public Library. Now we look at the, the, the Ponce de Leon, the Ponce de Leon Hotel in Florida. Very picturesque, maybe too picturesque, but uh, Thomas Hastings wanted to create an architecture inspired by the Spanish tradition and uh, look at the opulence of the of the interior. And not everything here is bad, actually. And if there is an excess of superfluity, superfluid, superfluous, oh, superfluousness, and probably there is, we should not forget what Voltaire said, that um, the superfluous is needed, actually, sometimes. Although in an age obsessed by entertainment, maybe we have too much superfluity or sub superfluousness. I'm not sure if both words do exist as such, but you understand. If the superfluous took over the world, it won't be a good thing. But a certain degree of freedom and maybe even a little bit of frivolousness, sometimes maybe, maybe sometimes could be a little bit okay, maybe, although I know I'm on a dangerous ground now stating something like this. But then is the picturesque truly, you know, a sinful positioning in architecture?
interesting this uh, illustration. <laughs> you know, the crocodile, uh, the reptile encircling the uh, the hotel by Carrer and um, Hastings. Well, there are actually three reptiles now, I see. I thought it was just one, almost biting its tail, like the Uroboros. But no, there are maybe the mother and the two, you know, two babies, two crocodiles. Unfortunately, uh, crocodiles also eat humans in Florida as well. The Flegler Museum in Florida, we read about it that it was considered the most beautiful palace in the world. I don't know. The trees are beautiful indeed. The building, but the building is maybe okay too, to an extent. It's a, it's a historicist building. It's not a building that claims great originality, but it, it's done, I think, rather skillfully if you accept the premise that it is, it is a building that uh, was not mainly interested in, uh, you know, great, great, great originality. And the opulence is uh, almost infuriating. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> but, but, the, the ex-president of the United States, who claims he's a modern man and a forward-looking man, is uh, actually, you know, covering every square inch of his apartment in, Trump's, in Trump Tower in gold. At least this is more discreet. But when you consider such an interior in the context where the T model, the Ford T model was taking over the world, you know, you, you wonder a little bit, you know. It's, it, there seems to be a level of incongruence here. Too much luxury. Now we see here gold as well, plenty of it. It's for, uh, you know, those oil magnates and the oil and the, you know, uh, those uh, great capitalists who afforded so much gold. Florida. And now the Jefferson Hotel, this one has been in Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Do you see cars? No, just carriages and horses. Although we do see a bicycle. This is interesting. So the bicycle uh, that did exist at that time. No cars though, just just car, just uh, horses and uh, you know uh, carriages with horses. But look at the interior. God. Only marble, of course. We are talking here about, uh, you know, the real thing. You know, these these, these columns are cover, covered in 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 marble. It is infuriating. The exterior is more sober. Thomas Hastings and Carrer and Hastings. We are approaching the end of this presentation, short presentation on this, on this kind of architecture and this kind of architect. And I end the presentation with this uh, itself kind of infuriating tower of jewels that was built for a, you know, a world's fair and it was covered with fake jewels meaning, uh, you know, made of glass. And I understood when it was demolished, those uh, pieces of glass, the so-called jewels, were sold for $1 a piece. But there were, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, or I don't know. Anyway, it was built in 1915 for the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, California. And here it is. A tower it is, 
uh, architectural bonanza, of course. Um, yeah. Dreaming about, uh, you know, a world which maybe never was. But all of this was stage design, actually, you know, built, uh, you know, to, to, to last for a few months. That's it. In a way, it's, it's, it's bad because it shows that we don't believe in our dreams and we just be like this kind of in, in a, you know, not, 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 not really convinced that, that we are only mimicking something that we don't believe in, in fact. Anyway. A strange architecture, uh, really. I mean, Thomas Hastings was was a skillful, uh, a skillful architect, even if maybe his aesthetical choices are too distant from ours. But he was skillful, uh, and I wish I had other other examples of his, um, you know, imaginative, uh, imaginative architecture. I understood that this tower, and that's why it was called the Tower of Jewels, because at night, when everything was lit up around it, it would just burn, you know, because of this, you know, the small pieces of glass that were, were covering the building. 1915. San Francisco. Carrera and Hastings. Although in 1915, I think uh, Carrer already um, was dead. I think he died in 1911. So at that time, probably just Thomas Hastings was uh, in charge of their office. Architectural bonanza. And the story continues. There are world's fairs very often in the present too, although we complain about the uh, limited resources and climate change, but human beings never learn, as Rem has said, correctly this time. At night, the Tower of Jewels, Thomas Hastings, thank you, and Happy birthday, Thomas.